I'm here today to talk about stories, storytelling, and ways to tell stories, uh, and the role that they play in building and developing technologies, and how we use them. Um, I feel like I need to start with a caveat that there's a lot of talk about storytelling in technology, telling stories through data, using technology to tell stories. Um, and I find it really trite, but I also understand why this is such a common trope. Um, because, as I will argue, I think that all technologies have storytelling elements. And that in order to better understand how we build technologies, we need to think a lot more about narrative. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my, my background and why I'm here talking about this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about different kinds of stories and what I know thus far. Um, I'll talk about this relationship between storytelling and technology. And give some ideas of where we go from here, both in terms of design, I'm a user experience designer, as well as development process, because um, if you know me, you know that I'm a process person. And we will also be doing some ideation about stories, um, because it's after lunch and we're all tired, and I want to hear what you all have to think um, much more than I want to talk to you. Um, so let's talk about the power in telling stories and the choices that we make in telling stories. Um, I love this quote from Nora Ephron's Heartburn, uh, which is a great book with great recipes. And uh, you know, the, I love the, how it starts with, if I can tell the story, I can control the version, which when you work in a technology environment, controlling the version is a very important thing. <laughs> um, and how we represent things is very contingent on the choices we make in telling stories and in presenting data. And I'd like to argue that the relationships that we have with technology are very much governed by stories and that a lot of the stories that we tell about technology have to do with, have a real human element to them. Um, I just read a great book about the phone freaks of the 60s and 70s, and one of the big, one of the like big aha moments in it for me was the idea that there that the phone system of mid-century America was scaffolded by telephone operators who not only were connecting people, but there was also all of this mythology about folks listening in, folks connecting you, and. What is that role that, of that, that human interface between data points and scaffolding infrastructure? I should start, I, sh I should back a up a little bit and tell you about who I am and what I do and what I have done. Uh, my first career was as a journalist and uh, I like interviewing people and listening to them. Uh, much less than giving a spin on things. And um, after college, I went to library school and worked as a librarian and an archivist for a while. And in that role, I was doing both a lot of cataloging collections, um, building digital exhibits, and also doing the technology. Because at that time, I, if you were a young librarian, it was your job to do the technology. And after a few years of that, I decided to go back to school and pursue a PhD in human-computer interaction. And during my time in grad school, I spent some time in big industry research labs at Microsoft Research and in Intel IXR. I also spent some time in the past few years caregiving. I had a child, um, which has a huge storytelling element to it. Uh, and for the past few years, since I've been in Portland, I've focused on UX research and design. And I do things like work with developers and art directors to say, OK, this is what this button does, and this is what happens when you click it. <laughs> so the common threads in all of this 
are data, um, and data in multiple forms, technologies in multiple forms, people and their stories, and the thread that ties all of that together is collecting. We are all collecting every day, and as I'll talk about later, we are subject to data collection every day. And that power to collect is a really important one, and it's one that we're not really taught, that I find to be pretty absent from the current discourse of uh, our social lives and technology. So this process, if you came to the workshop that Rachel and I did this morning, you saw this before, and this is a process that comes from the Stanford D School. Um, if you work with a UX designer, if you are a UX designer, you will see something like this. And a lot of UX designers are like, oh, well, this is my process, I invented it. Um, which, it's a lot of recycling. But using, when you use a design thinking process, oftentimes the first, the first approach is to empathize with your users and define their problems. And these two are so, narr they're so dependent on narrative. And the word empathy is really overused. I like to joke that you cannot bring empathy to the development process like you would bring a six pack to a party. Um, that's just not how it works. Um, but one of, the, one of my favorite definitions of empathy is that you can, you can begin to empathize when you can begin to tell someone else's story in a way that they don't find objectionable. Um, and defining the problems that your users have when de building technologies is huge. Um, and there's often a very big difference between what engineers think is, a, is the user's problem. Um, I've worked a lot on security recently, and it's, you know, oh, users don't know what, how, to, how to keep themselves safe. Whereas users will think, well, users will say, you know, I just don't know what to trust, and I don't trust anything, and I'm really worried about my privacy. And those two stories are so dramatically different. <laughs> where, to find the, where do you find the middle ground in, the, in that? And another point I'd like to make before I get into the sort of talking about particular types of stories is thinking about time. So in contemporary design process, design outcomes usually mean right now. I, a lot of times when I work on product teams, they say, oh, we have a one-year product cycle. Um, we'll have a new release in a year. And this is not very healthy. And it's not very, uh, I don't think it's very productive for building long-term relationships. Uh, this is a sketch from Alan Kay's uh, specs for a handheld computer from 1969. And it looks so similar to all of our tablets and a lot of the devices that we make. And it's the story, and I like to argue that stories are a technology that bridges us from now to the future and to the past. Um, Kate Eichhorn, who is a uh, historian who wrote this great book called The Archival Turn in Feminism, uh, makes this great argument that when you are hearing a story from the past, when you're looking at archives, you are in the future. And when we encounter artifacts in our past and we hear about how things were done years ago, we're in the future, and it's a very cool and weird feeling. And so why talk about stories? Why have yet another talk about stories? And I, I want to argue that, that stories allow us to think and imagine different pasts, presents, and futures. This is a little bit of Northwest history, the Riot Girl Manifesto, um, which Eichhorn talks about it in her book as you know, the, the connections between third, quote unquote, third wave feminism and fourth wave feminism and the earlier eras of feminism as often being set as in opposition, but actually really informing each other. So I'm gonna talk about three types of stories and we're also going to do a little bit of ideation uh, on the boards back here. I'm gonna talk about origin stories, the origin stories behind technologies and how they get told and what gets put in and put at, left out. 
I'm gonna talk about user stories, particularly as they're used in say like agile development processes. And I'm gonna talk about stories about technology, stories about how we're supposed to use technology, stories about how we do use technology. And unpack these a little bit and invite your thoughts on these three different types of stories and how they affect us on an everyday basis. So for the first ideation, uh, I want we, Chris in the back right hand corner has stickies and markers. And we'll go to the first, the first panel. And I want you to just write on a post-it note, what do you tell your family you do for a living? So to move forward, one of the most prevalent kinds of stories, most prevalent genre of stories we hear in technology are these origin stories. And we're often treated to splashy media coverage of uh, daring white men um, who are doing cool things with technology. Um, technology companies spend a lot of money on advertising and have done so for the past 30 year, 50 years. Um, but in those origin stories, a lot gets left out. Um, to use Apple as an, as an example, Apple's design staff, which in the mid 80s designed a lot of the elements that we still use um, on the Mac and Unix platforms, are, like, are largely uncredited. Um, Susan Kerr, who was uh, the icon designer for the original Mac interface, um, is widely revered in design circles, but very few developers know who she is. Um, and um, there's a lot of this that goes on in how we construe technologies. I would highly recommend Kate Lossie's book, uh, The Boy Kings. She was an early customer service employee at Facebook. And she's written this, she wrote this great essay about the unbearable whiteness of breaking things and how this myth of move fast and break things, ask for forgiveness, not for permission, is really only a viable narrative if you're a young white man of pro in pr privilege, and how if you're older, if you're a person of color, if you're expected to perform to gender roles or other social roles, being audacious, breaking things, is never that great of an option. Even how we get our hardware, how we get the technology that we use every day is subject to a real humdinger of an origin story. Uh, Lisa Nakamura just wrote a great book um, called Indigenous Circuits about Fairchild Electronics, who in the 60s built a circuit, a circuit manufacturing plant on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico, and how Fairchild's use of indigenous female labor laid the blueprint for outsourcing circuit manufacturing all over the world. And these, these stories are really important to listen to and to think about because they just, they, to use a, a really cliche word, they disrupt our ideas of how technology comes to us fully formed how technology is the work of individual geniuses, and how technology is somehow different from other consumer goods. So, a next, a next question to, to write out on stickies. What's the last story you told at work? Did you teach someone how to do something? One of the worst stories that I hear all the time is, oh, it's easy. <laughs> because that implies so much <laughs> about past knowledge. So please, uh, back to the boards. Um, did you comment some code? Did you present your findings to uh, your colleagues? So in my job, a lot of what I do boils down to gathering requirements, uh, eliciting user stories and writing user stories, reading other people's user stories drives me nuts um, because I often find that they're based on what engineers want to build <laughs> rather than 
what users actually want to do. And they're based in very like, contingent, functional scenarios. And one tactic that I use to dig deeper on that and to develop better user stories and ones that are better, more contextual is our techniques like empathy mapping, which, um, which if you, were, you came to the workshop this morning, we worked on. And this involves not only working on this doing quadrant, which is where most user stories are based, but also thinking about saying, thinking, and feeling. Um, and this is, these are useful contrasts, because when someone says, like, oh, I can figure it out, they're probably thinking, oh, shit, um, or are feeling over their heads. And unless you, unless you have some grasp of what else is going on in this doing scenario, your user stories are not going to be very useful. And the last, ta the last type of story that I'd like to raise for consideration are stories about technology. So if you know me, uh, you know that I love watches. I do not want an Apple Watch. Uh, I like analog watches and digital watches. And this Casio F91 watch, I've had one of these before. If you are a man um, or a person of color and you go into an airport with this watch, you'll automatically be flagged as a terrorist um, because this is seen, the Casio F91W is seen as the ISIS watch and, um, is a, and has been put on, on security checklists. And so ISIS and Al Qaeda members like apparently wear this watch, and it can be used to uh, as a timer for a bomb. It has been used as a timer for a bomb. So this is a very popular watch. It's been manufactured for 20 years. Millions of people around the world wear this watch, but because it is popular with members of a radical sect, <laughs> it's um, it will get you flagged at the airport. And there's lots of stories that we tell about technology. Um, there's a great, I read a great thing the other day about green bubbles. And that's a term used by iPhone users to describe texting with a non-iOS user. If you're texting with another iOS user, you'll have a blue bubble. If you're texting with someone with an Android phone or a regular SMS, message, you'll get a green bubble. And that's such a powerful story. Um, Brenda Laurel, who uh, um, was one of the original designers at Atari Labs, um, and is one of the sort of founding figures in design research, always talks about how stories are, an, stories are, rela are a relationship, and relationships are interactive. And our relationships with our technologies and our relationships in telling stories about technologies and through technologies is an interaction just like any interaction we would design in platforms. And in my, my work, I think about this a lot, how our relationships inform our interactions way more than where we put the button. And there's lots of ways to think about storytelling and stories about technology that are about new ways of telling stories. So a selfie stick is a storytelling technology, um, as is any sort of quantified self device. I, one of the things that I think about and talk about a lot is what's the long-term prospectus for quantified self data. Um, if I had my grandmother's uh, Fitbit data from when she was my age, um, I'd be fascinated. Um, likewise, 
you know, Disney has pioneered, the, D Disney has introduced this magic band where you have to wear this little sensor device when you go to Disney World or Disneyland. And it tracks all the rides you rode and every visit you make. And this is a really, this is, this is very thought provoking. Like you're allowing this entity to know your story and tell your story to you. Oh, last time you rode Space Mountain seven times. Um, and I found quite a few blogs where folks like talk about wearing their magic band along with like their Fitbit or their other quantified self devices. Um, there's also things like uh, WhatsApp um, and other communication technologies um, that are, thir are becoming third party data stores. So if you use, use a third party app to keep in touch with your, with your family, with your friends, to share news, where does that data go and do you own it or not? Um, you don't own it. That's, 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 the, that's the finding there. When I was working on my PhD dissertation, I was working on this question of community archiving and what it means to collect in a community, what it means to build collection, collections in a community. And one of the, uh, one of this, one of the definitions that I really, I found very resonant about community archiving was this, this term community control, active communicate participation in documenting the history of a group on its own terms. And one of the things that I find to be very, alarming and um, and to for there where there's a very there's a real lack of discourse is in this question of community control in share in sharing and saving data the platforms that we use to uh, tell stories to share stories to uh, to build archives are give us infrastructure for sharing. But, but they also shape them in ways that I don't think we'll be able to anticipate for years on end. And one of the things that I did was look at the evolution when I was working on my dissertation was to look at the evolution of photo uploads on Facebook. And as photo uploading features evolved, how did that change how folks uploaded photos, how they commented on their photos, how they tagged their photos? All those things are very important for long-term access. So now that I've rambled about stories in the long-term and um, personal data, this last question is way more, is way more pie in the sky. And it's how do you want to access your stories in the future? If your stories are your bridge between your past, your present, your future, um, how do you want to access them? Do you want to access them through your friends, through technology, through something you own, through something you can touch? Not at all, through your memory. So without further ado. As I wrap up, there's something I, one dimension I'd like to talk about in terms of capturing stories and sharing stories is this notion of specification and craft. In the past few years, we've talked, there's been some talk about code as craft and artisanal production in the digital age. But telling stories requires craft. It requires, it requires distinction and taste. And uh, the specifications that we use in everyday life are often far more rigorous than the specifications we use in building technologies. Um, I think about like if I'm like asking a friend to, I don't know why all my metaphors involve uh, bringing beverages to a social event, but say, say I'm making dinner and my friend says, can I pick up some wine? And I say, sure, you know, get a bottle of, you know, maybe a Gruner belt liner that's, you know, not too expensive and not too sweet because I'm making a roasted chicken. Things like that. They're very, like, that requires a lot of metadata 
And I think that there's a distinction that we need to make between data as a byproduct, which is how it's been treated in the history of computing. Data is something that is generated from computing. It you know, sits on a server somewhere. We can maybe like look at it later. And data that is meaningful, data that we can touch, data that we feel that we own, and data that we get attached to. I just did a user research study about passwords, and I had people draw their, pa their favorite passwords. And people's eyes lit up. They, were, they had stories. They said, you know, like, I created a password when I first got a Yahoo email account, and I used it for everything for 10 years. And even though they knew that like, this is totally unsafe practice, they were, ha they were happy to think about it. And they, you know, they could often think about the story behind it and who else knew it, who else in their lives knew their passwords. Um, I had a couple that I interviewed that the husband got mad at the wife because she had used his password for his favorite password for, a, for one of her work accounts. <laughs> And so, as I, can, uh, as I wrap up, I just want to bring out this question for discussion. What would our data futures look like if we could control the version? If we had control in our narrative, and if we designed for controlling the narrative, what would that look like? Thank you. We have some time for discussion. Mm -hmm.